Imagine a pandemic. Imagine being a doctor trying to save patients from a disease with no cure, no treatment, and no way out. Now imagine trying to find an answer. Your only test subject, only hope, is a child. Do you risk their life to save millions? I didn't become a doctor to lose lives. But as I walk through the streets and pass countless, lifeless bodies, I can't help but feel like I've failed. Victims, they come in, they report flu symptoms, fevers, nausea, rashes that turn their skin into scales. And by the end of the week, three out of 10 of our visitors never make it home to see their families. And those who do are left with scars for the rest of their lives. Some don't lose their life, but lose their sight. It's smallpox. The year is 1796. This wasn't the first outbreak, and it wouldn't be our last. For hundreds of years, we've tried to fight smallpox. It's a losing battle. We have no solution. So far, our responses have been controversial, to say the least. Some tried smoking, others prayed. My fellow doctors, believing that our vessels house diseases, even tried draining bodies of fluids in an attempt to cure smallpox. Medicine was tricky in the 18th century, but I had a hunch. I'd gotten word from across the pond, from Asia, of a potential answer. We could use the disease to stop the disease. Here's the idea. When fighting an unknown invader, sometimes the winning strategy comes from capturing a member of the enemy and interrogating them so we know what we're up against, so we can reinforce our defenses and carry out a counterattack. That's it. Use the enemy, smallpox, to mount a response. The only way for that to work, though, was to let the human body do the interrogating. And in order to achieve that, we needed to inject a sample of the virus into a living body. The virus that had taken hundreds of millions of lives with no cure. It was too dangerous. My only test subject was James, a boy no older than eight. I took an oath. I couldn't expose this boy to smallpox based on a hunch. But as I delivered him home and entered the countryside, I noticed something. Where the city streets were littered with bodies, the fields and farms were full of life. I saw healthy farmers, field hands, and animals. And when we finally arrived at James's house, I couldn't help but ask one of the farmers if he had any idea what was going on in the city. Of course we know, but we're not worried. Why? We're immune. Immune? How? There was no cure, no secret treatment. Everyone here's gotten cowpox before. And once you get that, your body's set for all kinds of poxes, I suppose. Even smallpox. I couldn't believe it. Cowpox, the milder, more manageable cousin of smallpox. That was the answer. It wasn't nearly as dangerous, and we figured James would have caught it eventually. So, we set out to test my new hunch. With care and consent, we borrowed the pus from cowpox blisters on the hands of my milkmaid, injected it into James's arms, and hoped for the best. At first, little James's temperature rose. He said he felt cold, his head felt heavy. I was with him the entire time, holding my breath. But after nine long days, <laughs> He got better, recovered, thank God. No lasting effects, no scars, and no blindness. So we moved to step two. We needed to expose him carefully to a small sample of smallpox. If I was right, and I prayed that I was, he would show no signs of sickness. He'd be, as the farmer suggested, immune. We injected the smallpox, and after a few days, no symptoms emerge. No fevers, nausea, rashes, Nothing. So after a week, we tried again. Nothing. My hunch was seemingly confirmed. And more importantly, James stayed healthy. Armed with these findings, I'm able to perform more tests on subjects from the city that were already at risk of fighting and losing to smallpox. This was my opportunity to save them before they went to battle, alert their bodily defenses, keep my promise as a doctor, so I inject in them a small sample of cowpox. I can't help but worry that their age, their diets, their bodies might change the outcome, that James was one in a million. But to my delight, they developed mild symptoms, developed defenses, recovered, and moved on with life. 
now seemingly immune to a disease that continued to take lives all around them. So in the midst of an epidemic, I hastily publish my findings. I tell this story. The farmers, cowpox, James. I prepare what is basically a booklet on how we might finally win against smallpox for the first time in centuries. Like everything else, however, it's met with controversy. Medicine is tricky in the 18th century, but sooner or later, it catches on because it works. People start using cowpox against smallpox. And finally, I reckon this new procedure needs a name. So, after the Latin word for cowpox, I decide to name this treatment vaccinia, or vaccine, the world's first. Today, thanks to this vaccine, smallpox has been eradicated with nowhere to go, no bodies with weak enough defenses to attack. Our age-old enemy went extinct in 1977. My name is Edward Jenner, and I pioneered the first vaccine. <laughs>